Good morning, UAI. Uh, I'm going to present my uh, art paper, Beyond Structural Causal Models, Causal Constraints Models. Uh, my name is Tineke Blom, and this is joint work with Stefan Bongers and Joris Moy at the University of Amsterdam. In a nutshell, our paper is about generalizing structural causal models to causal constraints models. So as many of you probably know, the standard starting point in causal inference is to assume that, um, that the underlying system can be modeled by a structural causal model. But is this realistic? Or in other words, can we really model real world systems by structural causal models? Well, often we can, but in this paper we show that SCMs do have limitations. And in particular, uh, they do not always, it's not always possible to have a complete causal representation of dynamical systems at equilibrium. So this is an abstraction of, uh, of a dynamical system uh, describing uh, the, um, how a system changes over time to just modeling its equilibrium instead. Um, and we try to make a link between the world of dynamical systems and causal models. Um, we also point out that there's no complete causal representation of functional laws or like the ideal gas law, like relations between variables that always hold. Um, as a solution, we propose causal constraints models as a generalization of SEMs and we show that they don't have the same limitations. Uh, and we also show how under some stability assumptions, they can be constructed from differential equations and initial conditions. So I was gonna start off with a recap of structural causal models. And then in the next few slides, I wanted to build from this to explain the intuition behind a causal constraint. Um, so SEMs distinguish between endogenous variables and exogenous random variables and there's a structural equation for each endogenous variable. And these have a particular form where on the left-hand side we have an endogenous variable xi, and on the right-hand side we have a function or causal mechanism that uh, determines the value of that variable, uh, with, and, and this function has as inputs the other variables in the system. And we can also model causality by modeling interventions, um, and this, is done by uh, equation replacement. But we also need to look at the solutions of structural causal models, and especially if we're looking at cyclic structural causal models. So if we're um, looking at equilibria of a process that evolves over time, we might end up with cycles. Uh, so we need to understand what happens to the solutions in that case. So structural, uh, a solution to a structural causal model is a random variable that satisfies the structural equations. But we can also look at this as structural equations imposing constraints on the solution space. So if we look at the solution space for two variables, x1 and x2, then uh, the blue line represents the constraint imposed by the structural equation x1 equal to e1 for one particular realization of e1. And similar, for another structural equation, we can draw another constraint, and at the intersection, we find the solution. For the acyclic case, the solution to the structural equations will always be unique, but this is not necessarily true for cyclic structural causal models. So a very simple, maybe trivial example even, uh, is given on the slide, uh, where we have x1 equal x2 plus e1 and x2 equal x1 minus e1, and both structural equations impose the same constraint on the solution space. And in this case, every point on the line is a solution. Now, in reality, e is a random variable, so we have multiple realizations corresponding to different constraints uh, drawn here with the dashed lines. Uh, and in this case, for uh, acyclic models, all solutions will have the same distribution, uh, but for cyclic models, solutions may have different distributions. So this sets the stage to think about structural equations as causal constraints. Uh, a structural equation has this special form 
where we know that it constrains the solution space of the model as long as the corresponding variable is not targeted by an intervention. And this is implicit in the way that we write the structural equations, but we can also make this explicit, and this is what we do with causal constraints. So for an SEM for variables x1, x2, and x3, we might explicitly write a structural equation x1 equals E1 as the constraint X1 minus E1 equals zero, and explicitly denote that this is active under, if there's no intervention, if there's an intervention on two, on three, or in both two and three. And we can do this for all structural equations, and nothing's changed, this is equivalent. The idea of causal constraints models is that we generalize this idea. So we allow for an arbitrary number of causal constraints uh, and also for an arbitrary activation set. Um, so instead of having this very particular form of the constraints on the solution space and the set of interventions under which this is active, we can just write the equations and when they are active uh, in a more general way. Um, so all the technical details can be found in the paper. I'm not going to go into that now uh, because I want to talk more about why we need such a generalization in the first place. And I'm going to talk about this uh, by using an example uh, provided by the basic enzyme reaction. Um, so um, this is a reaction between uh, four types of molecules uh, and it's really a fundamental biochemical process. So if you're thinking about a lot of processes that are going on in the cells in your body, often they are described by reaction graphs. And for reaction graphs, it is believed that the way that these molecules, how they evolve over time, is accurately described by a dynamical system, which I call a causal dynamical system because I believe the causality is already in the system itself. So uh, we say that a causal dynamical system consists of a time derivative for each variable and initial conditions for each variable. Uh, we think about interventions as uh, mechanisms where we fix the value of a variable to a constant. Um, and we assume that initial conditions are determined by exogenous random variables. Uh, for simplicity, we assume that the rate parameters are deterministic. Um, I, was, I talked before that we're interested in modeling the equilibrium or the stationary behavior. So uh, to understand the stationary behavior of the system, uh, I wanted to take a look at a simulation of the basic enzyme reaction for different initial conditions. So the uh, light blue, dark blue, green and purple lines show how the um, how the concentrations of S, E, C, and P, how they change over time. And what we can see is that for each initial condition, each trajectory converges to an equilibrium. But there is a difference because the green and the dark blue lines, they converge to the same equilibrium regardless of the initial conditions. Whereas the purple and light blue ones, they show dispersion. And for each initial condition, they converge to a different equilibrium. So the question is, is, can we model this equilibrium behavior by a structural causal model? Um, well, there is a structural causal model representation of the system, um, but it is not complete. So we can, um, and this is described in, in another paper uh, from random differential equations to structural causal models, how we can map dynamical systems to structural causal models describing their fixed points. So this is all the solutions, uh, all the equilibrium points of the system. Um, and the corresponding graphical structure is depicted uh, on the bottom of the slide. And note that this is cyclic. So we have cyclic relations at equilibrium. So what happens? The structural causal model representation is incomplete. So we can look at the solution space of the SEM on the left and the black line represents uh, all the solutions of the structural causal model. Now, the structural causal model already is, is, there's no more flexibility to model any more dependence on initial conditions or whatever. 
Uh, so it will it will remain incomplete. And for more details, uh, I, I would refer to the uh, paper. Um, so how can we look at this in another way? Um, we can look at again at the simulation for different initial conditions. And then we see that each of the equilibria to which the system may converge, depending on what initial condition it started out in, uh, this is a solution to the structural causal model. And we can actually um, find constraints that are imposed by these initial conditions. So the purple lines in the left figure correspond to different initial conditions of the system. And if we were able to add these constraints to our representation, then we would be able to find a unique solution um, and find a complete representation. So in that sense, there is a complete representation. The dynamical system itself is already a causal model, and if we want to model the equilibrium behavior, we could, in theory, just calculate for every single intervention what is going to happen, what is going to be the value at equilibrium of each of the variables. Um, but this is quite cumbersome. It takes quite some time uh, to calculate a table like this. It doesn't give us any insights, and it will be very hard to learn. Uh, so a question you might ask is, can we construct a more parsimonious representation of this system? Now, the answer is yes. The causal constraint model representation is, is complete. Um, how we construct it, can, the details of how we construct it can be found in the paper. Um, there's lots of equations, so I cannot uh, <laughs> describe the details here. Uh, but I just wanted to highlight some features of, of the model. Uh, so the causal constraint model representation consists of six causal constraints. Uh, so we make use of the fact that we can have more causal constraints. Four of them are actually equivalent to the structural equations in the SEM representation. And the two that we add have a different type of activation set. So the interventions under which they constrain the solution space are not of a structural equation type, where they are active as long as one variable is not targeted by an intervention. So um, we make use of both the generalizations. Um, so, this is just one example, but what I've told you uh, holds in more generality, and these are the main results in our paper. Uh, so, we show that in general there is no complete SEM representation for dynamical systems at equilibrium, uh, but there always exists a complete CCM representation. Um, we also show how under certain stability assumptions, complete CCM representations can be constructed from differential equations and constants of motion. Um, so we think that CCMs are useful in a wide range of applications because we believe that dynamical systems are quite close to describing real world systems. And then we can think about ecological models or economical models. Uh, for semi-stable systems, like some reaction networks or the movement of rigid bodies, <laughs> um, we can actually construct in a, in a nice way a CCM representation of the system. Uh, and another uh, point of interest is the modeling of functional laws, like uh, the ideal gas law or variable transformations. And we would like to look into that more in, the, in future work. So to conclude, in our uh, paper, we went beyond structural causal models and we introduced causal constraints models. We showed that SCMs have limitations and CCMs can be used to overcome these limitations. Uh, we continue to work on causal constraints models. Um, we've uh, been looking at Markov properties for these type of models. Um, and I hope that this will give us more insight in how the dependence structure and the causal structure of real world, wor <clears throat> of real world systems are related. Um, thank you for your attention.